um, of October. And so we decided to uh, dedicate this month's um, Menopause Cafe to this very important topic, when, especially when it comes to perimenopausal and menopausal women. We'll be looking at uh, basically um, what is osteoporosis, some of the symptoms that uh, one may encounter, what factors in our life or in our genetics could increase the chances of developing um, this disorder and the role hormones, of course, HRT plays in osteoporosis, how we can treat and prevent it. Before we get going on that, I want to um, introduce you to two new members of OMC staff. One is uh, Dr. Shashi Prasad, who's here with us today as well. She's a um, highly experienced GP and menopause and lifestyle medicine expert. She um, very beautifully in uh, sort of combines her um, knowledge of menopause, women's health and lifestyle to offer uh, bespoke um, individualized care to women. And I'm delighted to have her on board. And also um, my colleague and friend, Dr. Vera Martins, who I've had the pleasure of working with in the past. She comes from, she's a highly skilled naturopath and herbalist, but also a PhD in biology and she's a scientist. She's worked with uh, women's um, uh, health uh, for a number of years and with me caring for menopause and perimenopausal women uh, for a number of years as well. She went off on maternity leave and I'm delighted to have her on board because I've seen um, firsthand what, um, how much she can add to the treatments that I give to the patients and we just uh, bounce ideas. Um, so I'm really delighted to have you both uh, as part of the OMC team and Vera will be speaking to you later on. So going back to uh, osteoporosis, uh, basically just osteoporosis means porous bone. And it, um, uh, it's when the bone becomes weak and fragile and uh, at high risk of fractures from minimal uh, sort of stresses, but almost like, you know, no, nothing that you can think of uh, to um, that severe to cause a fracture, but it happens. Um, it's usually not um, a painful condition unless you start getting fractures from that, which of course then becomes painful. There aren't that many symptoms of osteoporosis, so you may have it and not know unless you start getting fractures. And so then you can have back pain, you can have loss of height and stooped po posture um, uh, from uh, fractures of osteoporosis. Uh, sometimes, as I said, stresses as mild as bending or coughing can cause a fracture, which is, uh, you know, really affects the quality of life of that individual. Um, and the, the fractures, the main part, part of our skeleton that is highly affected by this is spine, hips and wrists. Our bones are constantly renewing themselves. The, the height of the bone density is at the age of 35. So after that point, um, you know, individuals, both men and women actually, start losing um, bone mass. And new, uh, you know, there are two types of, uh, just to talk a little bit about the science of it as well, there's two types of cells in the bones. One is in charge of making new cells, which is called osteoblasts, and then osteoclasts are uh, cells that um, are involved with breakdown of bone. And there is a fine sort of tuning and fine equilibrium between these two types of cells, which then results in a healthy bone uh, so that you don't end up getting osteoporosis. Factors that can influence um, you know, development of osteoporosis is one is um, genetics and um, ethnicity. So although both men and women and all ethnicities can be affected by this uh, condition, but whites and Asians are at higher risk. Um, women, again, are at higher risk. This could be a number of reasons, but maybe because their bones are um, thinner naturally and um, less you know, um, mass uh, than men, especially, of course, after menopause. 
And I think the crucial point is actually before they reach their menopause. It's at the time of perimenopause when they can have periods of time when their hormones are particularly low, where they uh, start losing bone mass without knowing that this is happening. So um, other, uh, other stuff that can affect our, our risk, risk of developing it uh, is body mass index, which is basically um, a calculation of your weight to your height and the smaller frame you are, uh, you're at higher risk of developing um, osteoporosis. And of course, the, um, you know, the, you, you can be thin boned or, you know, be, have a high, low uh, body mass index because that's your genetic makeup or a person can have it secondary to an eating disorder, which then of course puts them at risk of developing osteoporosis. Having a first degree relative, like a parent or a sibling with osteoporosis can also put us at higher risk, especially if your mom or your dad had a, um, suffered a fractured hip, that is particularly a uh, particular risk factor. Um, sorry, did I go to, yeah, let me just move forward. So our age, um, as I said, you know, the peak bone density is at 35 and after that uh, in both men and women, but of course in men, the rate by which um, their hormones drop is much more gradual, whereas within women, that drop is much more sudden and, and much, much more drastic. So, you know, uh, the, you, especially at the time of perimenopause, which is around the time of menopause, menopause, six, seven, eight years prior to the end of the menstrual cycle, you can have um, loss of bone mass. Um, and again, the, the whole process of aging that, that can, uh, uh, can result in osteoporosis, but also with age comes chronic diseases, we know, and with chronic diseases come medications and medications have side effects. So even if uh, for people who don't have a family history of uh, osteoporosis or they're not at particular risk, but maybe they're put on a medication uh, to, that, that puts them at risk of developing this. For example, if they're taking high dose um, steroids for a long period of time, some of the chemotherapeutic agents, um, of course, and a number of other diseases that, for example, there, you can have diseases that stops you absorbing the nutrients needed for bone health. Um, like a, a, a few of the inflammatory gut diseases. Also smoking and excessive alcohol consum consumption, inactivity, unhealthy diet, so all the things that increases risk of, for example, heart disease, um, increases the risk of type two diabetes can also increase the risk of developing um, osteoporosis. And as I just mentioned, uh, medical conditions like celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, cancer, and treatment of these. Um, so either you know, the, the condition uh, not allowing one to absorb the nutrients that they're taking or that they're, the treatments that they're taking for these conditions um, are adversely affecting their bone. Um, and also, you know, if one is on a transplant rejection, um, anti-rejection medication as well, that can contribute to um, osteoporosis. Um, now, hormone function in all of this, what, what is the function of HRT and hormone? Um, I know you know, estrogen always gets the limelight in whenever we come to talk about HRT and, and the benefits of hormones. But I think this is one area where um, one or one condition where definitely the other female hormones, including progesterone and testosterone, also have an important role to play. Because as I mentioned before, there are in, in our bone health and, and a healthy turnover of bone, there are different classes of cells that are involved and estrogen and progesterone affect these differently. So actually progesterone, which is a hormone that is released when um, naturally a, a woman ovulates and 
you know, when you're going, when above the age of, you know, late 30s or early 40s, when a woman is going through perimenopause, even though she may be having, um, uh, she may be having menstrual cycles, but a lot of the cycles become anovulatory. So they're not uh, releasing an egg or, uh, you know, ovulating and therefore not making much progesterone. And that starts affecting their, their production of new bone. Um, estrogen actually, uh, one of the main uh, features it has, it, it reduces the breakdown of bone. And of course, testosterone makes the uh, cells bind, bind together very strongly. It also strengthens the tendons and muscles around uh, you know, joints and, and bones as well, which is um, an additional um, strengthening. So this is why um, uh, you know, it's important to assess a woman who's going into, uh, it's important to know if you are perimenopausal, it's important to know if you are entering menopause. Often, you know, women feel that, you know, if, you, if they're not having hot flushes or night sweats, therefore they don't need HRT. But that's not true for a lot of other individuals, for example, those who, who know they have a high risk uh, or high in incidence of osteoporosis in their family, or that they're taking medications or have chronic diseases that uh, increases the risk of developing osteoporosis. So they, although they may not have the classic symptoms or any symptom, in fact, of, uh, of uh, menopause, but uh, in those circumstances and in the absence of any risk factors, HRT is actually very beneficial for them to, to make sure that um, to either delay the process or to prevent it happening. Yeah, as we said, men are also at increased risk of developing osteoporosis and some do uh, with the reduction in testosterone and that, that uh, sort of brings back the importance of uh, other hormones other than just estrogen when you're replacing your hormones uh, if you're looking at bone health as well. Thyroid levels um, are important and they are affected at, at the time of menopause, especially in those um, women who have a, a family history or have a genetic predisposition to developing thyroid disease. Um, that, uh, thyroid, like, like the estrogen and progesterone, can affect many different parts of our uh, body, including the bones. So it's important to keep an eye on that and make sure that the thyroids uh, are, are functioning and replaced correctly as well. So yeah, we, uh, hormone replacement therapy, as I said, uh, it, it, um, it's definitely indicated in women who have a predisposition or a personal risk of developing um, osteoporosis, even in the absence of any menopausal symptoms. There isn't uh, any data at the moment to say at what exact level of um, hormonal level it becomes preventative or uh, it's optimal treatment for uh, when, when we look at osteoporosis. Often I get asked by, by you, by my patients, you know, what, what should my estrogen level be if, if we're trying to prevent or we're trying to delay osteoporosis? But there isn't, unfortunately, a, a, a available data to answer that. But there are acceptable um, and um, amongst menopause specialists that, you know, and, and we often try to push women to, to reach those levels that are um, accepted in, uh, between uh, specialists. But most importantly, actually, other than the HRT, is the lifestyle and, um, and all the other uh, things to do with your nutrition, exercise that you can do. And this is a time when a woman actually has a lot of control over her treatment and outcome of her condition. Uh, you know, if, if I really had to choose one, uh, which, you know, they work together, the HRT and the lifestyle change. But if, if it was only one, I would personally go for the lifestyle changes because I think that really makes a huge difference in the case of osteoporosis or osteopenia to the outcome and the, and the uh, quality of life of that woman. 
So on that note, and on the note of uh, lifestyle and nutrition, I will ask uh, Vera Martins, who is the expert in this, to take over from here. Thank you, Lila. So as Lila already introduced, uh, nutrition and lifestyle modifications have an important role in bone health. Um, so I'll try to give you an overview of why it's important and what would be the key nutrients we would be looking at and their role in the body. And then um, we'll break it down into showing, you know, how you can get more of these nutrients through diet, which is, you know, the foundation and like the first step. Then also uh, how you can get them through supplements if needed. And uh, also the role of exercise. And we'll touch a little bit on gut health and why that's important. Um, this advice can be safely you know, taken alongside HRT. So that's important to, to highlight. Uh, every case is assessed on an individual basis and there are people that may benefit from this advice on, on, its, on their own. Um, but you know, just to highlight, this can be done as a complement to HRT. Um, so this, uh, in this slide, we've got the key nutrients for happy bones, I say. Um, you are probably quite familiar with some of these nutrients. And I like to just, before going into more details, just to highlight uh, why they are important. Because if we understand, you know, what different things are doing in our bodies, we are more likely to, um, <clears throat> to be able to incorporate these changes if, if we know why we're doing them. So calcium, uh, obviously everyone has heard about the role of calcium in uh, bone health. And that's because calcium is one of the main components of of, of your bones, it's the building block of bones. It's very important in the mineralization of the connective tissue that uh, bones are made of mm -hmm. together with collagen. So that's it. Just calcium on its own is not gonna do the job. Uh, so that's why you've heard probably of vitamin D, which is very important in also in bone health as it helps calcium to be absorbed. It has also a role in terms of bone breakdown and formation. So what Lila was describing about how osteoblasts make bone and how oste osteoclasts uh, degrade it. So it's kind of helps with this, this balance. And then another two important ones in terms of absorption and deposition in the right place would be vitamin K and magnesium. So vitamin K ensures that calcium is not just absorbed but is actually deposited where it should be. So in bones and teeth. Uh, rather than you know stay in your arteries which can lead to further um, to further issues and the, the, in the vitamin k we've got there is vitamin k1 and vitamin k2 you may you've heard of the two types and when it comes to bone health vitamin k2 is the one that has a more important role so we will be looking at how to incorporate more of vitamin k2 into your diet or maybe through supplementation and then magnesium, it's also very important. Uh, it helps also to, 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 with the deposition of calcium in the bones, and it helps also with vitamin D. So it's almost like all these, uh, this kind of three, uh, sorry, four, calcium, vitamin D, vitamin K, and magnesium, they work kind of synergistically. Um, so if you're looking at, you know, how you can support bo your bones uh, from a diet point of view, you have to think about those as a top priority. And if considering supplementation, they would probably be part of a good uh, bone support formula. Vitamin C is also important because it's one of the main uh, cofactors for production of collagen, uh, which I mentioned is uh, also very important in, in, in the connective tissue that the bone is made. And then there are some other micronutrients that are also important in um, how all these nutrients are absorbed. Uh, such as zinc, copper, silicon, and boron. And you may find this also as part of a good uh, bone, support, um, bone support formula. So, so this is the rationale behind you know, these nutrients and why they are important. So oh, I was going to move it, but I guess it's Lila. <laughs> Next. <laughs> good for you, yeah. <laughs> She's in charge. Yeah. Oh, so is that. So the next, so as I said, we're going to move from, so we start with the food. So in terms of nutrition, how can you feed your bones? I like to say feed, we're going to go through feed, move and boost your bones. So feed your bones, we're looking at what kind of foods can we have in our plate, on our plate that uh, can support good, uh, good bone health. So 
we start with the obvious, the calcium rich foods, uh, dairy products obviously would be the ones that have the highest content of calcium. Talking about kefir, yogurt and cheese, these are good options. Uh, particularly kefir, uh, as kefir has also probiotic properties. So you have the advantage of being also looking after your gut health and the microbiome. Then green vegetables uh, are also known to have uh, good levels of calcium. Broccoli, kale, spinach, collard greens. Here, I would like to highlight that there is one, um, one downside, and it's particularly with some green vegetables, that they can, some, particularly spinach, as an example, they can be high in a substance called oxalates. So what oxalates do is that they actually reduce the absorption of calcium. So you've got kind of this scenario here. Um, in, 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 there is a way to actually reduce the levels of oxalate that you absorb by cooking those vegetables, so that helps. But perhaps you may want to choose, although for instance, spinach is quite high, is one of the highest in calcium from this, from green vegetables. Uh, if you are uh, quite efficient in calcium, you, you may want to um, make sure you uh, don't have too many of these this, this, this foods that contain oxalates or at least cook them. Um, other, other foods that are high in oxalates are rhubarb and beets. So, I mean, they are very healthy and it's not that you don't have to eat them, but definitely, especially if you don't have any issues with calcium, but if you do, maybe you just want to be a bit aware and or cook them. So this is a uh, one, um, one uh, aspect I would like to highlight. Then sardines with bone are also really high in calcium and soybeans are also a good option. And, uh, you know, I think for people that um, are, um, are vegetarian or are trying to avoid dairy um, for personal choices or for health reasons, then obviously then you have to rely more on, on greens and uh, on vegetarian options. So, you know, um, just keep in mind uh, that the levels of calcium will be lower there, maybe depending on your history, you may consider to supplement. So as I said, every individual needs to be assessed uh, on, a, on an individual basis, but uh, just something to keep in mind. Then vitamin D rich foods, um, the top would be oily fish and you have some in egg yolks and oat milk as well. So with the vitamin D, it's, a quite, it's important to highlight that although you can get it through food, um, you get most of your vitamin D from actually exposure to sunlight, as most of you know, uh, particularly exposure to UVB uh, uh, rays. Um, so, it's quite difficult to reach your um, the your levels good uh, optimal levels of vitamin D just through diet. So you need to rely either on spending enough time outdoors or supplementation may also be required. Spending time outdoors just kind of uh, a note on that because you know it's very general terms to say you know spend time outdoors, but how much and how much is safe. So a note on so the British British Skin Foundation advises that is safe to some extent to spend 10 to 15 minutes daily if you like for general population if you're not very light skin or if you don't have any predisposition for skin cancer or a family history so then 10 to 15 minutes a day have been shown to be to 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 allow for optimal levels of vitamin d production and is considered relatively safe from a skin damage point of view uh, these are, this is just a general, uh, a general sort of recommendation, but in terms of vitamin D, uh, quite usually supplementation is important, particularly in the UK, or if you are reaching your menopause years, it's quite important to keep an eye on your vitamin D, because not just for bone health, but vitamin D is key in so many other health aspects. Uh, including, you know, uh, the immune system, uh, your mood, and there is more and more research, uh, which is still preliminary, but also showing the, this role in diabetes, uh, in heart disease, um, cognitive function. So there is quite a lot to say about vitamin D, and it's something that is quite easy to supplement. Um, and if you're careful, it's not that easy to over supplement, which can have also issues. Uh, so it's something relatively safe to supplement. And I would say that the benefits are higher than, you know, um, than the, the, the cons. Um, vitamin K, as I mentioned before, vitamin K2 is the one that you would like to um, 
to, to boost in terms of bone health. And the foods that are rich in vitamin K2 would be beef liver, chicken meat, cheese, and natto, which are fermented soybeans. These are the ones that will have the highest amounts. Uh, vitamin C, we have citrus, uh, kiwis, peppers, and rosehip seed powder is actually an interesting one. It's rosehip uh, seeds are really high on vitamin C. And it's something that is quite easy to incorporate like on a daily uh, basis in your smoothies or porridge. So that's a good one to, and it's very good for your skin as well. So that's a win-win. And magnesium. Uh, so magnesium is, has to be like one of my favorite minerals. It's like a top mineral and it's super important, not just for bone health, but particularly around perimenopause and menopause. It has to be one of the supplements that we really want to make sure, um, so one of the ingredients that we really make sure that is in your uh, that you have at optimal levels and if not to supplement. Um, so magnesium um, is also important in adrenal functions. If you are too stressed, your levels of magnesium are quite likely to get depleted. So you need to make sure that you know you keep up with, with your magnesium levels, which is not always po uh, possible or that easy through diet. If particularly you have a very active lifestyle or um, if you are um, yeah, working quite hard and stressed. So it's something to keep an eye on. Uh, so anyway, when it comes to bone health, it's also very important for the reasons I already uh, specified. And in, from, a, from a food point of view, you can find them in leafy greens. So all the kale, spinach, cabbage, you know, Swiss chard, uh, bananas, raw cacao, that's a nice one. You can always incorporate it in a smoothie on a daily basis. Uh, raw cacao is also very good um, for mood and cognitive function. So that's also a win-win there and it's delicious uh, if you like it as I do. Uh, nuts, so Brazil nuts and almonds will have the highest amounts. Brazil nuts are a good one as well because they are very rich in selenium, which is very good for thyroid health and thyroid health also with you know, bone health and all your hormones go hand in hand. So um, just a note on not overdoing on Brazil nuts because they are actually very rich in selenium. So if you start to eat too many Brazil nuts, you can have an excess of selenium, which is also not ideal. So it's recommended like two a day and do not overdo it, especially if you are on supplements already. And then seeds uh, that can also be, uh, be high in magnesium, particularly chia and pumpkin. So this is a, yeah, a combination, a, a sort of uh, um, an overview of the foods that you can incorporate into your diet and, and mix and match on a, on a daily basis. So the next we move is to exercise. So how to move your bones. Um, uh, here is, uh, there is quite a lot of research also showing that uh, exercise has an important role in, in bone mass. Um, so, uh, and the research actually shows that in, in a specific way, it's important to combine certain types of exercise. So weight-bearing weight exercises are important because they are known to improve bone mass density. So those include things where you move a lot, like jogging, dancing, uh, climbing, uh, aerobics. And so brisk walking is also a good one, especially if, you know, um, you want to do something a little bit lighter or there are maybe other health conditions where you cannot do cert, you know, certain kind of exercises that are a little bit more um, high resistance like uh, jogging, so brisk walking is still fine. Um, and then uh, resistant exercises are the ones that will improve your bone strength. And these are more like the weightlifting and the resistance bands are a good example. Then in order to, in order to increase flexibility and posture, it's quite good to also incorporate some sort of exercise like yoga or Pilates. And those have also the added benefits of helping you with to balance your nervous system, possibly will improve your, um, your sleep and response to stress. So that's a quite nice kind of exercise to incorporate into your um, lifestyle and self-care routine uh, when you reach perimenopause anyway. And so ideally we would be mix and matching these three types of exercises uh, on a weekly basis and it's recommended like 30 minutes of exercise daily. This may sound like overwhelming. So if it's too much, that's why I always like to say, you know, every person is different. And the best thing is to talk if you are curious about trying new things or if you are, um, uh, or you have any concerns, it's always good to talk to someone and just, you know, start with what you can do because that's the best way. Just you know, whatever you can do, it's already amazing. Even if you can just take 10 minutes in the morning to do breathing and yoga as a starting point. It's about what works for you. It's about, you know, starting and building up things. That's the, the main thing. 
And just to know that if you have actually been diagnosed with osteoporosis or have any um, history of broken bones um, in the past, it's important to just talk to someone, to your doctor or health practitioner before you take on any kind of exercise uh, that is new for you. So that's me on uh, moving bones. And then we've got uh, here a slide on supplements and herbs. So like an extra way to boost your bones. And here, um, so the su supplementation is kind of, I cannot say that everyone can supplement. It's again, it has to be assessed on an individual basis. Um, I will talk about this in specific, one of each in specific. So I'll give you a bit more of, of uh, understanding of maybe why you should be taking certain supplements and if it is for you or not. So with the vitamin D3, I start with that because vitamin D, as I mentioned before, it's, um, it's one of, it's a very important uh, vitamin that actually most of us are quite likely to be deficient, particularly in the UK. So this one, I think it's something to definitely assess if you need it. Uh, and um, women that, uh, you know, reach uh, uh, are in perimenopause years and close to menopause, I think Leila may agree, it's always a good idea to check your levels of vitamin D. Because if your levels are low, that can be quite detrimental for your bone health. So you want to rule out that one. And in any case, if for some reason you cannot afford to do it, it's good to have to be uh, on a maintenance dose, dosage of vitamin D. And this is actually what the de Department of Health recommend that everyone in the UK should be on um, 400 international units, which is 10 micrograms of um, vitamin D daily. Uh, uh, and if you uh, actually have any sort of, um, um, if, if you don't, if you are, if you have really a dark skin or if you don't expose yourself to the sun or very little, uh, then this should be uh, done throughout the year. Actually, you should take vitamin D uh, for the whole year. Uh, if in, in, if you don't have, if you not fall into these categories, it's recommended to do it actually just from October to March. But this is the recommendation. Uh, so vitamin D3, I think is quite important. And um, you have vitamin D3 or vitamin D2. There are two options available in the market. Vitamin D3 is the recommended one because it's uh, better absorbed and is the um, already like um, active form that your body utilizes. Um, and uh, it's good to have it in a format that uh, it's um, in sort of a fat sort of solution, uh, or you can have it with foods containing fat because that improves absorption of vitamin D. So I always recommend to have it with your breakfast and have with some sort of fat. Um, it could be olive oil, it could be a yogurt, something that has some fat in it. Um, the other uh, top supplement to consider obviously is calcium. So calcium, uh, just on a note, is important to take it like uh, divided throughout the day. So in two dosages, for instance, because it's better absorbed in smaller dosages. Um, and as I explained before, it's really important that it's taken together with magnesium and vitamin K and vitamin D. So it's properly absorbed and deposited in the right place. So in the bones. With calcium, um, some questions that you may have, don't know, I can already sort of have, sort of give us insights on the types of calcium that you can find in the market and why you should be taking some and not. So you can find a calcium uh, citrate. So a calcium citrate is usually um, uh, the kind of calcium that is uh, better to take. Um, calcium citrate is not as, um, uh, it's better for the stomach. Um, and it's better absorbed. So people that actually have issues with like stomach acid production, um, and um, maybe you have been diagnosed with some sort of inflammatory uh, bowel disease, uh, this will be the best type to take calcium citrate uh, in opposition of calcium carbonate. So calcium carbonate is cheaper uh, it's kind of, uh, you can have a higher amount when you, when you buy the supplements, but it's not as better, it's not as well absorbed and utilized by the body. So calcium, uh, uh, calcium, this is the best kind, kind of calcium. There is also a, uh, more recently, there is a different type of supplement for calcium, which is based on, um, seaweed. So it's extracted from seaweed and that one is really, um, 
at the moment is one of the most expensive, but is one that is the best absorbed by the body. Um, and uh, there has been show, uh, study, studies shown that it actually increases a, a marker of bone growth. So compared with the other types of calcium. So if you can afford that, that would be the safest kind of calcium to have. Um, what can I say more about calcium? Um, yeah, so if you should be on calcium supplements, I think that's, again, we need to look at each individual case. But um, if you have a history of osteoporosis or maybe predisposition or family history, you may consider that. Uh, obviously, if you have issues with absorption as well, um, low stomach acid, or if you are actually on any medication to reduce stomach acid, so PPIs, that's something that you may have to consider as well. Um, or if you are on a vegan diet, um, you know, you may also want to, to, to consider where the calcium is a supplement to add. Um, so as I said, it should be taken always in a combination with magnesium, vitamin K and vitamin D. And, um, you know, looking at a sort of all round formula for bone support, you may also uh, see some of the micronutrients I mentioned before. So boron and silicon. From a herbal point of view, there's not a lot in terms of what can boost really your sort of um, bone health in terms of density. And, but uh, two herbs that are good to add to your routine, you know, I wouldn't necessarily suggest to rely just on them, but uh, nettle is uh, very rich, you know, in certain minerals, including iron, but also calcium. So you can add a daily infusion of nettle as a good way to boost your um, to boost your sort of calcium intake and your bone health. And horse tail is also good because it's rich in um, silica, which is also quite important in bone formation and strength. Um, so this is from a herbal point of view. So next slide. Yeah, so finally, uh, just, you know, one thing that is super important is gut health. And I just would like to finish with that, just to give an overview of, I mean, gut health is important for anything as most of you are probably aware. And uh, obviously for gut, uh, for bone health is also key. And um, why is that? So one obviously uh, reason is because if your gut is not working in optimal levels, you are not absorbing the nutrients. And you know, like all the nutrients we were talking about, even from a diet point of view or supplementation, you wouldn't be able to absorb them and you would have nutritional deficiencies. And so that will down the line result in issues with, with, with your bones. So looking after your gut health is really important. And that becomes even more important when we reach like uh, the age of 50 and, and, and beyond because uh, the production of stomach acid naturally declines with age. So we are already going to be having naturally less capacity of digestion. So we wanna make sure that we're supporting our gut health in the best way possible. In addition, um, gut health is also super important for hormone balance. And this is an all other topic that maybe one day we can talk about it here as one of our uh, menopause cafes. But uh, uh, you, the, the, the balance of your hormones relies quite a lot on how well your digestive system is working. Because again, it's how you, you get the building blocks of hormones through you know, what you absorb from food, but also there are key aspects of your gut, like for instance, the good bacteria in your gut that help to metabolize estrogen and other hormones. So if you don't have the right balance in your gut of the right uh, bacteria, the good friendly bacteria, you are more likely to have a, a hormone imbalance, which can exacerbate your, your uh, hormone symptoms, including in menopause. And that can apply even if you're taking HRT. So, um, and this is in, in that sense is also important because if you're taking HRT also to support your bone health, you wanna make sure that you are uh, um, absorbing and, pro and metabolizing those hormones properly. So gut health is foundation as well. I uh, hope I convinced you with that. And so just in a nutshell here, it's, it's a really sort of complex one with gut health, but these are like just key points that I think is important to just keep in mind and hopefully they'll give you a bit of a, a foundation. So um, 
add anti-inflammatory foods into your diet as much as possible. What are those wild uh, oily fish, nuts and seeds? So good, uh, they are rich in um, good fats um, and omega-3, uh, particularly wild oily fish. So this is really important to keep your uh, um, inflammation levels um, at bay. Um, all grains, um, antioxidant foods such as berries, green tea, cacao, and a variety of fresh vegetables. So this is just like the foundation. Um, it's also really important to incorporate probiotic foods into your diet. It doesn't have to be on a daily basis, but maybe something you want to do like two, three times a week. And um, those would be kefir. Uh, you can have dairy uh, format or water. Both are good. In, they both have probiotics and they both have good um, benefits for the gut. Uh, maybe if you're trying to avoid dairy, kef uh, the water one is a good option. But you know, there, if, although it's dairy, kefir is actually uh, very good and lowering lactose. So it's not, unless you have a proper lactose intolerance, uh, you may wanna try dairy kefir that you may be able to tolerate. Um, and kombucha, sauerkraut are good options as well. So one important advice that I actually start my consultations talking about gut health is how people are chewing and sounds like a very basic one, but I actually have seen people improving massively just by chewing more their food. Um, because digestion starts in the mouth really. And if you are already not chewing properly and not uh, properly starting to digest food in the mouth, everything else, you know, downstream is going to be affected. You're not going, you're not going to break down your food properly and you're going to have more chances of fermentation and that will create further problems, you know, like, a upset your gut microbiome, create inflammation and food um, intolerances. So it's just the starting point really for problems. So it's very important to be mindful how you're chewing. 15 chews per bite is actually a good sort of uh, average and, um, and way to go. Uh, try to remove stress from your life. Um, stress has an, an impact in, uh, in your gut massively. Uh, we know that it reduces production of stomach acid. So um, that's one way that stress can directly impact on your gut. And then obviously just be aware of any food intolerances and re reduce or remove as much as possible, uh, remove or reduce as much as possible the usual culprits. So the refined carbs, sugar, caffeine, alcohol, processed foods, they should be at minimal. And then it's also important to not uh, have excessive and repetitive intake of certain foods because this has been shown to actually create more of a predisposition for intolerances and inflammation. So try to have a, a diet that is varied as much as possible. And then be aware of, obviously of antibiotics and painkillers. Do not overuse them because they will also affect the gut lining and the, um, the, uh, the, the, the good bacteria in the gut. And then finally, things to consider. This is not for everyone. It really depends on your symptoms, but you know, something that we can discuss in a consultation on one-to-one -one is that maybe there is the need to incorporate some herbs that will help you to start digesting the foods better. Ginger is a very easy one. Fresh ginger, you can add to teas, to your food. Maybe start the day with a glass of warm water with fresh ginger, and that helps not just reduce inflammation in the body, but also to start um, um, increasing the, the, the secretion of gas juices. And there are herbs that go an extra mile like gentiana, dandelion root, artichoke leaf that can actually uh, be even stronger at promoting a secretion of gastric juices and, and stomach acid. Um, but it's, you know, need to be sort of advised more on an individual basis. And so other natural things to do at home with fennel seeds. It's very good, particularly if you have issues with excess gas. And then digestive enzymes and HCL may be actually recommended in more extreme cases. But these are all important to make sure that you are digesting your food properly. Um, and then things to consider if there is uh, maybe um, signs of inflammation in the gut, either uh, these are things we can detect also by testing or maybe the signs that you show. Sleep realm and turmeric are great additions you know, that you can have uh, on a daily basis add to food turmeric for instance or you can have supplements as well if uh, higher dosages are needed and sleep realm is like a star herb for um, for uh, reducing inflammation and is something that becomes really important in in a menopause um, perimenopause and menopause protocol that I have advised many women uh, with gut uh, gut health issues so 
yeah, so this, in a nutshell, this is, you know, some highlights on how you can promote your gut health, but it's a very complex thing. And obviously, depending which symptoms you come with, some of these may be recommended, some not, and, you know, a protocol can have a combination of different things and um, other aspects that I have not men been mentioned here as well. But I hope this gives you a bit of a um, sort of a food for thought. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Vera. That was a very interesting and very uh, detailed uh, journey through the supplements and um, lifestyle changes that we can make, which are so important, not just in osteoporosis, but in the menopause care in general. So thank you for that. You're welcome. My pleasure. <laughs>